So there are two penguins. Oh yeah, I love this one. And um, you know they had some mar marital difficulties. They were married. You, know, you guys have heard about these penguins before. Um, you know, side writers, salt, whatnot. Um, but they they worked through it, and uh, they lived many happy years. You know, they they uh, you know some people who don't end up having children end up being the most interesting people in the world because they have, instead of children, hobbies. I know a guy who didn't have kids until he was 43 years old, and uh, he literally rebuilt the car, learned woodworking, and has a, I want to say the right word, a forge? I think that's yeah. what it is. Mm -hmm. He makes swords in his garage. Just, oh, bam! He learned, it took blacksmithing lessons. Well, and he I don't know. Um, but he, uh, you know, so people, they, they got into their traveling, they got into their hobbies, but um, unfortunately, the humans, penguins people use. Penguins. Okay. These, these, these penguins, we're back on the penguins, they, they um, got into traveling, they saw the world, but unfortunately, um, through global warming, their continent started to melt. And so they lived a lifetime together, well, these penguins. Oh, it is isn't real. It is in this joke. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, and so they, um, you know, these are the same two penguins. We've established that. I have to get back into it, please, Joe. Sorry. <laughs> so they're, they're traveling, they saw the world, global warming, it started to melt their ice cap. And so it started to melt, it started to melt. There was like 99 penguins in um, their village, and, and you know, they, they were. They knew them as the older couple who were so happy. Um, and uh, the, the polar ice caps started to melt. And one day, they found that there was a huge cracking noise, melting had happened, and the village cracked in half. And 49 penguins were on one side of the crack. And 48 penguins, if it's not right. 50? 50? Yeah. 50. Yeah. 50. Yeah. 50. Right. Penguins are on the other side. But they were still together. And um, so it went on. Um, things got warmer. Their igloo started to melt. They're having problems, you know, keeping everything cool. Their fish were starting to go bad, you know. But, but they were still together. And they still loved each other. And it um, happened again where they noticed the edges of their little ice. They're starting to float out into the sea, floating on this, this big ice raft. And it happened again. Cracked it in half. 25 penguins on one side, 25 penguins on the other side. But they were still together. And so went on. Um, things were starting to get um, a little bit more desperate now. They had to... Um, engineer out of kelp and seaweed these like hats so that they don't get sunburned and and so they did they 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 i used the word engineer they crafted they made they tailored these hats but but they're they're not getting sunburned um and and they're still together and they still love each other and then <clears throat> happened again they're drifting they're drifting north towards the equator um, it's getting warm, um, it's getting wet, and so um, one day, a couple days after the last time, the ice cracked in half, and there was 25 penguins on the ice that when it cracked, and there were 15 penguins on one side, and 10 penguins on the other side, but they were still together, but they were on the one with 10 penguins. They, uh, they like to live a little bit away from everybody. They're kind of country penguins, not necessarily city penguins, you know, but all penguins are city penguins. You get it, you get it, you can follow. Their, their house was farther away than the other one. Um, so um, that day, um, they're on this, on this floating ice thing with, with 10 other penguins, and, and they're trying to keep everybody calm. The young people, they're, they're telling stories, they're, they're, they're talking about how they work through their typewriter issues, and it's starting to get wet. You know, like before it was all frozen, and so you know they're not like wet all the time. Now they're wet all the time, and they're having to deal with mold and grossness, and it's just kind of gross. 
And so, um, it's humid, it's hot, it's sticky. And one day, the ice on which they're on splits apart. And there are six penguins on one chunk of ice, and there are four penguins on another chunk of ice. And they're still together. So, uh, this penguin raft is floating north of the equator. They're starting to see, or north towards the equator, they're starting to see uh, land in the distance, you know, palm trees, coconuts, they hear tribal, like, like, like Jamaica kind of music, seal drums and stuff coming from them. This is all very foreign to penguin people who live in the Arctic circles of our globe. They're very scared about how foreign everything is and, and what's going on. Um, keeps hitting up. It's not a big chunk of ice they're floating on right now. There's not a lot of room for the people. It's starting to get difficult living with other people in such close proximity. They're fishing what they can. They're scared of the sharks that are in the water. And one day, the ice cracks in half. And there are two penguins on one side of the ice and two penguins on the other side of the ice. But they're still together. And so they're there, they're alone together. They, they know that they love each other, they know that they live their life together in love as penguins. And they're floating on this ice and they don't know what's going to happen. And one day, the ice cracks in half. And one penguin is on one piece of ice, and one penguin is on the other piece of ice. At first they were sleeping. Come on, Joe. Um, they were sleeping when it happened. They didn't realize it had happened at first. They wake up and they realize that they're 25 feet apart. And all they can do, they don't know what to say. This is the end of their relationship. This is the end for them. And they have eye contact, and they just maintain eye contact. And you know how the sea, you can be floating with a pile of shipwreck for days and days. And so this is how it is. They're very slowly gripping. <laughs> the lady penguin is on one chunk. The guy penguin is way over there. They're still, they can't even see each other's eyes anymore, but they're looking at each other. And he's in the sunset, he's to the west. And as he's drawing back into the sunset. Barely, they haven't said anything. Barely visible as he disappears into the horizon, yells, Cherry
before we start our text today. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for crimes that I had done that he groaned upon that tree? Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Will night the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in? When Christ the mighty maker died, for man the creature's sin. Thus might I hide my blushing face while his dear cross appears. Dissolve my heart in thankfulness and melt my eyes in tears. But drops of grief can near repay the depth of love I owe. Here is the Lord, I give myself away. Tis all I can do. And then there's the refrain, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I'm happy all the day. Yeah, you know that. You know that. I know that part. That was added to this hymn in the 19... Written in 1707. Um, appropriate for our text today. Let's pray and get started. Father, as we study your cross and your resurrection, Lord God, we pray that your heart for us, Lord God, would be on display, Lord God, that we would sit at your feet. Lord God, um, but it's through the power of your gospel that you are communicating grace, Lord God. We pray that this gospel, Lord God, understood uh, by the students in this room, would go on to transform the world, Lord God, knowing that these students have been with Jesus. And knowing the power of the words that we're studying today, Lord, we pray that you would just be glorified. And we pray that you would give us uh, a very productive, very fun, and very happy last day here at Calvary Bible Institute. Lord, we thank you. And we pray that you would be here. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, my yeah. Um, we're in Luke. Chapter 23. Verse 26. Sure. I just wanted to point out that I, I, I found uh, something interesting, uh, or that found, but I heard something interesting uh, here yesterday that, that Judas had his whole side open. Go with them too. 
You've heard that, right? Mm -hmm. um, in this culture, soldiers of the Roman Empire um, were masters, and the people were subjected. And so Roman imperial soldiers could ask you to do anything, and it was your obligation to do what they asked you to do. They could ask you to take up to one mile of you carrying all their equipment so that they had rest. Um, and so that's what Jesus was talking about when the Romans, or when he said, if anyone asks you to go one mile, you go too. Um, he's talking about that. Simon was conscripted by the Romans to carry Jesus' cross. Why was he conscripted to carry Jesus' cross? Because the Romans were not. Okay, that, we just covered that. But also because Jesus wasn't able to carry the cross. He wasn't physically, um, he was broken, he was injured, he was hurt. Um, he could not carry the cross. Like, 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 he wouldn't be able to pick it up. Um, so they conscripted Simon to carry it. Um, it was tradition that you would carry the cross beam of the cross. Now, don't know where you get this. Don't know how I can prove it, but this is what I've been taught. Um, so you'll see, um, at the crucifixion, or in movies about the crucifixion, um, the thieves carrying just the horizontal piece, not the vertical piece of what they're going to be hung on. You'll also see that they're tied to it, not nailed to it. Um, that's regularly what crucifixion was. Um, this crucifixion, the nails, is unique. And for some reason, we know that he carried the entire cross, not just a cross beam. So, um, let's move on. And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, the wounds that never bore, the breasts that never nursed. When then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For they do these things in the greenwood. What if what will be done in the dry? Um, 31. I don't know what that means. Um, but what? who is he talking to when he's telling this? The women who are mourning, who are his disciples. And this warning is for daughters of Jerusalem. It's about what's going to happen in Jerusalem. And it's about the destruction of Jerusalem and Israel. And he's like, he wept over Israel and Jerusalem. And this is, uh, why would the daughters of Jerusalem be saying, blessed are the barren, the wombs that never bore? Because they never had to see their sons get killed and their daughters sold into slavery. And having a child to take care of when you're fleeing is impossible. That's, that's why they're talking about David. Um. The, the green word is usually when you, you got sap in the tree, but you break the branch off of the tree <coughs> and uh, dry. When he's referring to dry, it's just like brittle breaking, right? Is he not referring to like Revelation again, where he's saying like when this like scorching sun is upon the earth and the earth's like drying up and the waters are turning to blood and stuff like that? Because he's, he's quoting, he's quoting uh, verses that point towards Revelation. Is he? Yeah, I mean, like, mine, I remember studying in Revelation, just when they're in the caves and they all yeah. come to the mountains, and they're like, falling us, like, because there's, like, there's a lot going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's so, is the Greenwood and the Bone Dry somewhere else in the Bible? Uh, <coughs> yeah. We found it in the Dry. So, the Greenwood and what we found in the Dry. Is that somewhere else? That's your homework. You got a computer. There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right and one on and the other on the left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And 
they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even as the rulers sneered at him, saying, He saved others, but himself he cannot save, if he is the Christ, the chosen of, let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. And so people um, looking on, sneering um, for his garments, they cast lots. Um, I believe this is for Jesus' garments, not the purple robe that Herod and Pilate dressed him in. Um, so uh, on the other, in the Gospel of Matthew or Mark, or Matthew, it says that the garment is um, one piece, meaning it doesn't have a seam in the middle. It was sewn in a circle. I don't understand. I'm not, I'm not a seamstress or a tailor. Um, but it was really desirable that that the Roman soldiers were like, I want this piece of clothing. It was 19... Uh, in the 1960s, people... to clothing. Like, like one-tenth of what you make goes to clothing. Not, not on average, people did one-tenth of their income. It's not like a rule or anything. Now it's less than 4% of your income is spent on clothing because clothing has gotten cheaper. In Jesus' day, clothing was one of the most substantial material possessions you could have. You might have two pieces of clothes. You might have a lot more if you're a super rich person. But for a common person, you don't have a lot of clothes. The clothes that Jesus was wearing, we know that he had friends who had money. We know that he... But it was, it was a rich person's clothes. Um, I've heard uh, an argument that that's why I wear nice clothes as a pastor, because Jesus had this garment, and they, like this whole sermon was on it's like garbage. <laughs> um, but, but you know, like Jesus was wearing nice. Clothes. Someone bought him this. People gave a year's salary to pour oil on his feet. Um, so why? Um, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ. They're mocking him. Um, they are hating him. There are also a multitude of people mourning uh, simultaneously. The soldiers mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written up over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Um, we, you guys talked about this in depth in minor prophets class yesterday. Um, any notes on that? Yeah, so they each got like a parting description. The full description is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Yeah. So each one will have a different part to it. Like the majority of them say the King of the Jews or this is the King of the Jews. Like, like I think John um, would say that. And then they all just have different parts of the whole inscription, but if you put it together, that's what it is. Yep. I think you guys have a firm grasp on that. And then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the, answer, the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. I missed two verses, didn't I? Yeah. I wanted to know what that guy said that was so profound. <laughs> we were indeed justly, and we indeed justly, for we received due reward for our deeds. But this man had done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Um, I, um, there's a cult in town here in Yucca Valley. Um, they're called the Something Desert Pentecostal Church. Um, they sell cherries and they have a print shop in town. Um, they're, they're literally called, they're led by a uh, charismatic leader who's a little bit older. Um, but uh, I, I talked to one of these ladies because I wanted to buy cherries. 
It's delicious. Um, didn't know I was sponsoring Satan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jesus went 
literally to hell when he died. And um, like either took the keys of hell from Satan or something like that. And okay, that's, that's some people believe that. Um, a lot of people will take the parable or non-parable of the rich man and Lazarus um, where there's a chasm fixed between these two places mm -hmm. and um, what he does is he goes to what we call Abraham's bosom and Hades the grave is on the other side and there's fiery torment on that other side and he on this side says preaches to the captives the people who are waiting for him and so the theology is that Every person, since Abraham, the father of faith, and, and if you go before Abraham, you have Noah, righteous Noah, and you have Adam, and you have um, Seth, and the line of Seth, and all those people. Excuse me. Um, Methuselah, thank you. Um, you have all these people before then. Enoch um, is in there. Um, but since faith... Everybody who has believed in God and trusted Him for righteousness is waiting on Jesus so that they can have access to the Father. And so that's the theology. Um, again, I haven't decided on anything. I, I haven't been there. I haven't figured I haven't been there. Of course I haven't been there. <laughs> um, I haven't I haven't weighed it all out. But um, so after Jesus' death. He either preached the gospel to the captives, or this verse means that he ascended. What does it mean that he also descended into heaven? In order to ascend into heaven, you have to not be in heaven. And so the other interpretation could be he descended into the lower regions of the earth is here where we're at right now. Um, so you can believe. What's the Romans verse there? I'm sorry. Yeah. Wait, where you are. Romans 10, 6-7. Thank you. Who will ascend to heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. And then Acts 2.31 if you got that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Today you will be with me in paradise. That was about the sixth hour. There was darkness over the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two, and the Father Jesus, and then Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, and he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Then the centurion saw that had happened. He glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd came together to that side, seeing what had been done. They beat their breasts and returned. But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member. Not consented to their decision, to their deed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. And this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. When he took him down, he wrapped him in linen and laid it in a tomb that is never was that was hewed out of rock, and no person had ever been lain before. And that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. And so, a few things: uh, the women are watching as Jesus is, as Jesus dies and is taken off the cross. They're mourning. These are Jesus' disciples. His mother is there. We know that. We know that John is there, um, and we know that none of the other disciples are probably there. Because all forsook. And we know that John was there because of the conversation reported in the Gospel of John between Mary, the mother of Jesus, and John, um, the apostle. And he says, Mary, behold your son. Son, behold your mom. I don't know what happened to Jesus' actual brothers and why they're not taking care of their mom. Um, but for some reason, John gets adopted as Mary's adopted son who's going to take care of her. Um, and so... Um, the women are watching. Um, there's three mentions of the women here where we're going to study. Um, it tells this narrative of them to the tomb. And so it's important that we catch that. And I'll point it out when we get there. Um, and then we got...
Joseph of Arimathea, and it said, what about Joseph of Arimathea? There was a detail it gave. Uh, he was waiting for the kingdom of God. That's not the one I'm looking for. It's on this page. It was a good a council member. And so it's believed that that is, he is one of the Sanhedrin. And so we know that Nicodemus was one of the Sanhedrin. We also know that Joseph probably was one of the Sanhedrin. And um, actually, correct me if I'm incorrect on this. Is Nicodemus recorded with him in another gospel? Uh, Nicodemus and yeah, Joseph so. go get the body of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. John. Um, so, so Joseph of Arimathea is probably one of the Sanhedrin who did not consent to the death of Jesus. Wasn't invited, probably wasn't even invited to the um, meeting um, where they decided to kill Jesus. Um, I need to be on the next one. Sir. It's in John chapter 19. And it's both of them. Verses uh, it, in verse 39 says, And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a picture of myrrh and aloes about a hundred times. Where is that? Uh, it's John 19, verse 39. And I thought it was cool because it says, verse 30, he is the same. He's a good, just man. It says, After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came into the body of Jesus and the goodness who, who, who came to him for a second. So, so, yeah. so this is a modern photograph. Um, 
it's not like that. It's it's literally maybe this far off the ground. He's everybody can see it, and it's a, it's a symbol of terror. Um, looks like a skull. They know that he was let out this gate, and that there was this skull there in that time. So we almost certainly believe that this is Golgotha, and this is the place of the skull. The Catholic Church, um, it's the Roman Catholic Church. I have a lot of friends, I, I don't have a lot of friends, I um, love several Catholic people. Um, I don't love Catholicism, for obvious reasons. Um, have another site, as they say, is where it happened. And um, they built a church there, and it's called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, and so the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is inside the gates of the city. There's a hole there, and they gilded the hole, but they said that they rested the cross. You know, it fit into the hole, and you'll go there, and uh, there's people crying and kissing the hole, and there's incense. And then there's a cave inside the church also, and that's the tomb where Jesus was laid. Um, so, um, nearby, um, let's, let's read, let's go back to this real quick. As for when he had took it down, wrapped it in linen, and then laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock, where no one had ever been laying before. Um, that's significant, where no one had ever been laying before. Um, so, um, and another gospel that says immediately nearby, they had to do this before um, the darkness fell. And so I'll show you this as well. This is the garden tomb. This is literally a hundred feet from Golgotha. Um, this is um, this little tomb that was hewn out of the rock. There's a trench right here. Um, right here where a stone could roll. It'd be a large flat rolling stone. Um, I'm not one to like, this is the spot. That's the one. Like, let's get excited about it. Um, Hillsong United did a music video right in front of this. It was like a resurrection, you know, song. Um, they've done tests recently on this tomb, and it's been discovered through the earth and the rock, and they did the test that nobody has ever decomposed in this tomb, um, which is kind of crazy. That's why this is really says some awesome time. Yeah, like, like they, they can find that out. I don't know how, I'm not a scientist, um, but there's this tomb. I, I've walked into it. Um, let's, let's see if there's more pictures. You've been there, dude? Because uh, the, yeah. the stone gets rolled away and the angel's sitting oh, above the tomb with a countenance like lightning when they come, right? Yeah. So. Um, Actually. 
actually, that, that makes a lot of sense. Who we talked to about that? That's Gerald Haberman. Yeah, it's Haberman. Also, um, Abraham said the Lord will provide him seven times five and that's what we have to do. Yeah, 
Spirit again. I looked at it, and I think it's like regarding the tribulation, and like he said, when they flee to the mountains, and he says, he's like, you should cry for yourself. So the now is the green, right? The young, or whatever you want to say, the piece of wood while it's alive, and the latter would be when it's dried up. And so it's like your future is not looking so bright, you know, for those who are going to go through these things, the Jewish people. Um, I think that's, that, that's what Pastor Bob said. I have peace with it, you know. I said, absolutely. So I checked um, to see if there were more mention. I think it's together throughout all the Gospels. There was like a, a cumulative like six, I think, are mentioned. They always mention Mary Magdalene, all four of them. In Matthew, they mention and the other Mary. In um, Mark, they mention Mary, the mother of James, and Salome. And in Luke, of course, we get. Uh, where are we? Oh, lost my place. It's um, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other with women. Yeah. So, and then in. John just says Mary Magdalene. Mm. So. The road to Emmaus. Any and, and now behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus, which had seven miles from Jerusalem, and they talked together of all these things that had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have one with another and walk and are sad? And Clopas, Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who have not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty of deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him and condemned him to death and crucified him. Notice that Clopas says, Cleopas, I don't know why I keep going now, um, was a prophet, mighty of deed and word before God and all the people. Um, doesn't make a divinity claim about him, Jesus. But we were hoping that he was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all of this, today was the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company, who arrived at the tomb early, astonished us when they did not find his body. And they came to the saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who, was, who said he was alive. And certain of those who went with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. But him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter his glory? And the beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Okay, so what do you think he read from the Old Testament? He started at Moses and all the prophets and he expounded to them all the scriptures. What did he reveal to them? What did, what did he show them? What passage? The prophecies from Isaiah, Zechariah, Malachi. The coming of the Son of Man. Okay. And yeah. saying that it started in Moses and probably also went to the creation when God promised that uh, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Right Anything else? Anything specific? Resource that can enable us to stay calm inside no matter what house storms rage outside. 
here's a clue. Mark has deliberately laid out for us an account using language that is parallel to the famous Old Testament account of Jonah. Both Jesus and Jonah were in a boat. Both boats were overtaken by a storm. The descriptions of the storms are almost identical. Both Jesus and Jonah were asleep. In both stories, sailors woke up the sleeper and said, we're going to die. And in both cases, there was a miraculous divine intervention, and the sea was calm. Further, in both stories, the sailors when, then become even more terrified than when they were before the storm was called calm. Two almost identical stories with just one difference. In the midst of the storm, Jonah said to the sailors, in fact, there's only one thing to do. If I perish, you survive. If I die, you live. Jonah 1, 2. And they threw him into the sea, which doesn't happen in Mark's story. You guys catch that? Let me read that paragraph again. Two identical stories, just one difference. In the midst of the storm, Jonah said to the sailors, in effect, there's only one thing to do. If I perish, you survive. If I die, you will live. Jonah 1, 12. Then they threw him in. In Mark's story, or does it? I think Mark is showing us the back a bit and look at the rest of the story in Jesus' view. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, One himself, I'm the true Jonah. He meant this. Someday I'm going to calm all storms, still all ways. I'm going to destroy death, destruction, and break the brokenness and kill death. How do we do that? He can only do this because he is of um, he can only do it because when he is on the cross, he is thrown willingly like Jonah in the ultimate storm under the ultimate waves, the waves of sin and death. Jesus was thrown into the only storm that can actually sink us. The storm of eternal justice, of what we owe of our wrongdoing, the storm that wasn't called not in hell but swept him away. The sight of Jesus bowing his head into the ultimate storm is Burn to the core of your being. You will never say, God, don't you care? So, if Jonah dies, everybody else lives, and Mark makes this connection. And so that, that could have been the narrative one that Max was talking about, or Abraham and Isaac, or many of the other pictures. What about Psalm 22? Psalm 22? Yeah. He definitely references this. And if you turn back to Psalm 21, Max, you turn and talk about um, how they didn't have. He didn't say, Psalm 22. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you take any other interpretation of why Jesus said that on the cross, other than he's quoting Psalm 22, then you've got some very strange theology of God turning his face away from and rejecting Jesus. And then, like, that's where you get that, is that first, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, I don't see that. He's quoting the Old Testament. And he's calling to mention this messianic prophecy from Psalms. Notice he said, uh, beginning at Moses the prophets, and he's kind of done all the scriptures and things concerning to himself. Uh, so Psalm 22 would be included in that. As they draw near to the village, sir, you raise your hand. Oh. Just stressing. They were going, and he indicated that he would have gone forward, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward the evening and the day is far spent. And he went to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to him. And their eyes were opened, and they knew it. They knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did, our, did not our heart burn within us as he talked? with us on the road while he opened the scriptures to us. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and they found all the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying he has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Why didn't they recognize him? We'll never know. And so we could believe that, you know, he was just marred, or we could believe that they they couldn't they wouldn't recognize his marred face. They wouldn't notice someone with scars on their face or something. We could we could also believe that um, they weren't allowed to recognize him. 
God wouldn't allow the neural synapses to connect and go, oh my gosh, you look exactly like my, my rabbi who I followed for the last three years everywhere. And just until he broke the bread, um, they didn't recognize him. It's kind of pointless to talk about what I like talking about. Mm -hmm. So you said you were to eat of the Passover until it's filled with the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So this would be a reason to think that what he meant by that was until he was accomplished. Mm -hmm. that really so that could be it. Does he eat it?
This gives the impression of a legal transaction, a cold piece of business, almost a trick of thought performed by a God who is logical. We want to worship. It goes on to say, no one will be justified until he reaches heaven. Further, he said, I must stress again that the doctrine of justification by faith is not what Paul means by the gospel. The gospel is not an account of how people get saved. Really. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel by which you are saved. <laughs> N.T. Wright is N.T. Wrong. <laughs> He's got jokes. And all who accept his high-sounding words raised up against the true knowledge of God are still in the state of Luther, but without the fear. Going to hell.
is that seems like a fair like trade off. Like to go to hell for eternity seems to be a punishment. Doesn't hurting, you know? So I was like, how does this work? Cause, and like obviously like we think of like God being angry and he needs something just to beat up and we're like, okay, so he sends himself and he just whips himself and he beats himself. And it's not necessarily that. Yeah, and so I was I was kinda like I don't wanna say that I was like kind of the same conclusion they were, but like I kinda got to this point, I was like, okay, so like man fell and by what like it, I think Romans five is like a great section on this. Um, and and man fell, and in that, like one man brought sin into the world, and we see that in uh, in, in five here, one man also referred to Jesus to as the second Adam comes and takes the the, the uh, sin out of the world. So I just kind of started seeing like, okay, this is like God said that man like the wages of sin is death. So we know we know that. So God set the price in the beginning, and now God has placed His word above Himself, so He's going to go to fulfill that because God is. Just, like just so God's just just God so then he sends um, Jesus who is basically the second Adam which is like a perfect I wouldn't say a perfect great image but like a, a very like close like and you can see God's justice being carried out between the two one man brings it into the world one man takes it out and like I, I think if I just read Romans 5 it would be easier for me to explain because I'm so tired so long <laughs> Um, <laughs> no, I, I follow you. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I, I was just trying to work that throughout, like work that in my head, because I was like, Jesus, like, then hell, Jesus would go to hell, because it doesn't make it doesn't make sense. So the death of a, a man who doesn't deserve death, and then we see that um, for if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God. And the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounds to many. And so I was, I was just kind of like going through that section. I was like, okay, so like I'm kind of seeing like why Jesus had to die and why did Jesus die and atone for our sins. It did, I don't know, it didn't make, I don't know if it made much sense. <laughs> you know, in the beginning, I was like, God sent himself down to earth to be beaten and destroyed and then die just to be resurrected, just to sit back up with God. Like, how does that, how does that, like, and we, if we don't follow God, we get sent to hell for eternity. That's not, like, that's not, that's not an eye for an eye there. When I realized that, well, Adam, Adam fell via which is his death. God set the price in the beginning. And Jesus sends a man who has no father and you know, Adam only had one father, you know, it, like Adam's father was God, and and uh, Jesus' father was God. And like, there's, there's like some really cool connections between like, I can't remember the movie right now. Um, okay, but yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Sick. But yeah, but like, I don't know. So, so Jesus didn't have to go to hell. Yeah. Um, in our place, he had to die in our place. You know what I mean? The yeah. wages of sin is death. Yeah. Um, and so what is hell and what is death? Well, hell is referred to as the second death. Okay. Um, hell is like ultimate separation from God. Separation from God. And so um, Jesus didn't have to go to hell because of the resurrection. And so this, what we've already studied, well, we're, we've gotten the resurrection. Um, the crucifixion is half of the story. You don't have the full thing if you don't have the resurrection. Yeah. They're the same, like you have to have, if you have a coin, you have two sides to that coin. If you play an electric guitar, and you just have an electric guitar, you don't have an instrument, you have to have an amplifier. That's the full intru- instrument. Um, you you have a car and you have an engine. Like, like, like it's one thing, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so you can't separate them. And so um, Jesus rose from the grave, proving that sin, death, hell, suffering in in this world are subject to God. He is stronger than all of those things. He died in our place. His blood covers our sin, but he's stronger than those things. You know, you're hungry. Uh, can I ask more on that subject or would you rather? Um, no, we don't have a lot of text left. Okay. We have a lot. Um, so I, I struggled with a lot of the same questions David has had, mm-hmm. and 
basically what, what I would ask is um, if the, like the sacrifice could be killed in your stead so that you won't have to die. And so that image makes sense with Jesus. But if that lamb had been resurrected, would that still have been a proper sacrifice? And so the question is, like, how did, how did Jesus die instead if he rose? That's the question. And then the other question is, like, even in the Old Testament, lambs could cover a congregation or a household. Um, how does that make sense? How could Jesus be a sacrifice for everyone? And, you know, so, so the question goes a little bit deeper than that. Why is God satisfied with a blood sacrifice to, to atone for sins of people? Yeah. I can't answer that question. That's a philosophical question. And that's a question that we don't. I can't say I'm able to do it. But I, I, I don't know that I've ever been satisfied with an answer why God needs blood. Like, why don't we need something else? The life is in the blood, maybe, even mm-hmm. the theology in that, mm-hmm. you know, and, and this is how he engineered it. But I, I know that you're not satisfied because he's God. Or that's why he, that's how he wants to do it. But that's the only answer. And I can sacrifice. And God said sheep are okay for this as a covering, but to take away it's got to be the blood of a sinless person, and that's Jesus. John? Um, I, I, I may butcher this because I haven't been in Exodus in a while, uh, but I will, uh, it wasn't it that, that the whole congregation of Israel um but they didn't want to get close to uh, to him because they will die. Isn't it? Uh, couldn't it be just like a cause and effect? You are impure, therefore you will die because of that, because of the overwhelming purity of, uh, of the Lord. I think so. I think there's an element of that. And then again, what we're talking about isn't like scripture; it's philosophy. Yeah. And so, like, like is sinful flesh? Mm-hmm. Sinful flesh cannot be in my presence. There's something like that. Yes, yeah. no, no, no sin will be in my presence. And so, like, the all-consuming fire will just melt you. Like, <coughs> Indiana Jones melts you. Um, if you're in his <laughs> and, and But with the MP- We'll get to your questions here. Um, if I have a son, let's say Haley, Haley brings forth Ophelia, our daughter, and uh, we have another child, um, another daughter, and when, when she's five years old, she gets a bike. Um, and I, she has this bike and rides this bike and loves this bike. And then the, then she turns eight years old. And this little bike is, is like, like her knees are above her wrists, you know, at this point. And so our second child is like, that bike is my size. I would love to have that bike. And I say, this bike is no longer your bike. It's your bike. And the second child. And so this bike has been imputed to the second child. And so, um, whose bike is it? It's the second child's bike. And so, the righteousness of Jesus has been imputed to us. Is he um, no longer righteous? Is he, is he no longer righteous is the question? I, I don't understand. I don't know. Um, I don't think that's the case. I think the resurrection proves that he's still righteous. How is it? Yeah. So there is a doctrine out there that a lot of people who I listen to their sermons would believe. And so have you ever heard of a five point skeleton? There's a difference. Um, the, the point that these Calvinists are disagreeing on. Um, I have Stephen Furtick and um, Mark Driscoll and Matt Chandler are four point Calvinists. Um, John Hyper is a five point Calvinist. Um, D.A. Carson is a five points Calvinist. You have the five points, which this is not a class on Calvinism, but the one that they divide on is limited atonement. T U L I D. Tulip is the, the, what is that called? Acronym. Acronym. T U L I D. Total depravity. Um, universal atonement. Limited atonement. So um, in Calvinist doctrine and informed theology, um, the blood of Jesus only atones for the sins of the elect. 
meaning Jesus' death on the cross only covers those people who will have faith. Everybody. Now, the way I phrase it, you can get behind probably. Um, unlimited atonement was Jesus took on himself the sin of the entire world. That's what I believe. Like, he died for everyone's sin. Um, God so loved his God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that you who should believe that send him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might have life. And so the, the blood of Jesus covers all sin, not just the elect, not just those who will be saved. And so limited atonement is actually one of the most offensive pieces of Calvinism to people like me. And so, um, it's important that you know that. Any questions? No. David, did you have something? We already talked. Um, so, would we hold to the view that sin is like an existing object? Or would we, like, when we say it's concrete or abstract? Like, we, we think we enter the, like, I've always said this when I was popular, but we enter the presence of God, like, I can wash over sin, like, the sin will be instead of, like, wiped out. But then I think to myself, like, the only reason to do this is because God is trying to say, you know, you know? And so, like, I think as I walk into the presence of God, it's like, the only reason I'm destroyed is not because there's a magical force that God can't control. Or, like, okay, you're not, you know, too bad you walk into my glory. But, like, the fact that, um, the fact that God has. So, let me answer what I think. Let me give you my definition of sin. I, my, my definition of sin. This is how I understand sin. Um, for being unrighteous before God. Um, it's positional. And it's not like you have it, you're there. And so um, I stole a cookie out of my, my mom said, don't eat this cookie. And I went and ate the cookie. Or I, I hired a prostitute and killed someone. You know, like both are sin. Am I sinful if I eat a cookie? Yes. Am I sinful if I'm a fornicating murderer? Yes. yes. So I'm positionally a sin sinner. It's, I, I, it's not like a degree, it's not a scale. I'm in the sin boat. I'm not on, like, like if there's a border. You know, here's Arizona, here's California. I'm in Arizona, I'm in California. You know, um, I've become a sinner and I'm now in. Why is California not the same one? <laughs> <laughs> don't don't forget that. Um, do, do you follow that? Yeah. I, is that how? Well, I just, like, that's how the conclusion like, is. It's more of the, the fact that the person is wrong with God than the, the fact that you're actually physically changed. You know? Or all things. You mean there's.
Now, there's two other steps on that ladder. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. Uh, threefications, if you will. Um, so, you are made positionally holy, and then sanctification is the old stuff is brought out, and new stuff is brought in, you're being renewed, you're being washed in the water of the Word, you're looking more like Jesus, you're being refined in the fire, all this is going on daily. But, no matter how long you live, God will continue to dig, and to pull, and to grab more stuff out. Until you die, and you're glorified. And so, so those three terms, does that help you? Um, yeah, I, I understand justification. I think I'm a little more like at the process of justification, like that area. Because justification is a process. Like, I would say, well, there's no, three justification steps. happens instantly. Well, yeah, I would say that, but like, like there's three steps in justification. Like, the, the, the fact that justification means that you were once something wrong, you would you'd be, you would be, um, wow, I'm sorry, like, I felt cardiac pastoralism hyped up about the same So, justified? <laughs> you're not justified? You are justified. Yeah, but you're not justified. You are justified. There's no gradient, there's no scale, there's no process. Well, it's, no, no. it's a light switch. You're it's just it's on. I get that. Off. I get that like that center step of being like the center step. The, the, there's no there's Jesus, no but there's Jesus no center, center there's nothing center. else. Jesus. Salvation by grace through faith. I don't know. I, I can't argue right now. <laughs> I can't. Sir, so, so I'm just going to try to sound. The, the conclusion on the like, landing on the moment, and I guess back to the conversation, is that salvation by grace and faith simply means that it doesn't make sense. That's why you need faith to just believe in the free gift, to believe that God is gracious and that he forgave you, not necessarily by some logical, philosophical method, mm-hmm. but like in the same way. It's difficult. Um, you know, like, a lot of people think that they're really intelligent and say, you can't say that or you have to say that. Um, I would say that faith has three definitions. Um, first of all, it is um, a word for us. We have, we're of faith. We believe in God. Um, the, the atheists would say we, we have religion and we'd say, no, we have faith. Um, and, and so it is our belief. We're, we're a faith. I, I believe in science. I believe in faith. Um, I have a faith. Um, another definition would be um, trusting God who he says he is. And then the third definition is what we're talking about <coughs> is that there's unknown aspects that we don't understand. It's not concrete. It's, it's a little bit abstract. And like the nature of God, who He is, what He's going to do. Um, there's a there's an essay by C.S. Lewis. It's called Transposition. Um, Angel knows how to do this. He can transpose chords. Like if he's looking at a chord sheet and it's in the key of G, and it needs to be in the key of E, he can transpose it um, into the key of E, knowing knowing the scales and knowing how to do that. It's difficult when you're first starting out. Um, I have to think about it if I have to do that. But there's also transposition in um, classical music. Um, when you have a piece that was written for an entire symphony being played on a piano, that happens. That's a real deal. You can play a symphony like like 96 members were supposed to play this 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 piece, and you simplified it. You brought it down. You take the four melodies and played it on a piano. Lewis makes this gorgeous analogy that right now we're hearing it's like it's like if you if you had just this piece of piano music and you're trying to understand it's the only piece of music you've ever heard and someone's trying to explain woodwinds and brass and and percussion and cellos to you using this piano 
like, no, it's like this. And you're like, so, and, and every note sounds the same. It's got the same melodies. Like, and then, this um, was the, this in this um, paper. You should really go and read it. It's phenomenal. I don't think it's on C.S. Lewis Doodle on YouTube, um, but it should be. But um, a woman is thrown into prison. The prison is a deep, dark hole, which only sees the sun, or only sees the sky. And it's a narrow hole, just enough for her to uh, see out. And she has a child in this prison. This woman was an artist. And when she's thrown in the hole, in her backpack is a sketchbook and a pencil. And so this, she's pregnant, and she gives birth to a son, and that son grows up. She is fed, she nurses him, um, she teaches him how to speak, but he's never seen anything except for the opening in the ceiling. There, there's not a lot of color, there's no detail, he's never seen animals, he's never seen grass, he's never seen anything. And his mother, who's an artist, takes the pencil and draws a field and says, this is a field. And he can't get past that the outside world is just these dark lines. Like, like I mean, so there's lines that, no, there's not lines, it's, it's hills and it's rolling and there's grass. Can you imagine trying to find that, trying to grasp that without that being a concept? That's this world versus what God is doing and what the next world is and who God is. And so there is a huge unknown element and that's what faith is. I'll never have all the answers, I'll never have all the truth, but I know what God is, or, or what God has done in my life, what he's revealed to me, how he's spoken to me, and there's this measure of he wants me to come and to meet him and to talk and to and to have this interchange where I don't know everything but I'm trusting that. You guys follow? Max, did we say maybe that we by faith know that God saved us through very logical and reasonable terms that we just don't understand yet? I would say that. that's that's what I believe. Sir. What is that CS where where can I find that CS Lewis? Transposition. Yeah. It was published in nineteen eighty nine in a book called The Weight of Glory. And it was published before that. He gave it as a reading, but he read it, he preached it as a sermon, and then he got put in a box and not published until nineteen eighty nine. Sir? Okay, so I
what's going on. Uh, Jesus revealed himself to the people um, on the road to Emmaus. They had journeyed from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And uh, Jesus was going to keep going. And, and they said, no, please stay with us. And so, I don't know, I think the 12 miles is what I'm going to make. Emmaus is from Jerusalem, but I don't quote me on that. That's just, I think my subconscious is like that. Seven, seven miles? Might be right. So so they get there. Jesus reveals to himself in his dark. They sprint back. They run the seven miles and find the apostles in this where we're picking up. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet. And that I myself handle and see the spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. And so he appears to his disciples. Um... They think they're seeing a ghost. Um, and they thought they've seen a ghost before. It, the word that they use um, when Jesus is walking on the water and they're terrified. The, the, if you remember the story, um, Jesus is walking by on the water and he's not walking towards them. He's walking by. That's, that's the language. And they go, Phantasma! They say, it's a phantom. It's a ghost. And they're terrified. These are superstitious. A lot of these people are superstitious sailors. Um... And so, um, verse 37, but they were terrified and frightened, supposed they had seen a spirit. Um, and so he says, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands, my feet, and that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. In early Christianity, there was a heresy, and it was like... Mormonism times ten thousand, and so half the church, half people calling themselves believers, believed in something called Gnosticism, and it was the first major, besides persecution, a uh, major attack on Christianity. Um, if you, there's, there's a couple. If you want to understand Gnosticism? It goes straight to like, like the line from Gnosticism to Satan worship. Is pretty short, like before, uh, when you get there. Um, but and so is the line from Mormonism to Satan worship. It, um, but this is not a whole studies class. Um, one of the fundamental truths of, or tenets, not truths, because it's not true, of um, Gnosticism is that Jesus did not appear, was not a person. He was a And so a lot of what the, the gospel writers wrote was true to combat that, that. This is recorded um, possibly to combat that and because Jesus literally said this. Um, because they thought they saw a spirit. He said, no, I'm not a spirit. You can see that I handle things. I have feet. I can give me food. I'm going to eat the food. Um, but also... And he showed them his hands and his feet, and they did not believe um, for joy and marveled. And, said to them, have, and he said to them, have you any food here? And so um, it's recorded here and in other Gospels that there's a wound in his side, and that there is stripes on his back and holes in his hands and in his feet. And so um, it's really cute, but it's uh, I'm the same about the same hands and the wounds are not cute. Um, the only man-made thing in heaven is the scars on Jesus' body. And so um, Jesus shows us those. Um, and then we see the scriptures open. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you which, while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, thus it was necessary.
necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. For you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of the Father, my Father, upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you can do with power upon high. So you get two things right here in the last, um, last red section of the Gospel of Luke. You get, wait for the Spirit in Jerusalem. That's what he's saying here. You also get the, the Great Commission, but it's not in the Great Commission language like it is in Matthew. It's a little bit out of order. And that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. For you are witnesses of these things. And so it's out of order, and it's not the one we've done. Um, it was necessary for Christ to suffer and rise on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Um, but behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power on high. And so they are waiting in Jerusalem. Um, picks it up in the Gospel of, or in, in the Book of Acts, and he let them. As far out as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. And so Luke reports this. Um, he leads them as far as Bethany. If you remember that picture of the Mount of Olives that I showed you, he ascends. From the top of the Mount of Olives, he's over. He goes over that eastern hill in Jerusalem. Um, it's recorded in the, the Book of Acts. It's exactly where it picks up. It actually backs up just a little bit um, where it picks up, and Jesus says that thing again, and then he ascends. And in the Book of Acts, it's funny. Um, an angel has to come down and say, "Okay," they're all just standing and looking. Like, I can imagine, like, like, like if, if this is what's going on, like, and you just watch Jesus ascend, you wouldn't. Okay, let's go. You know, um, I saw a rocket launch in, in uh, Florida a couple months ago. It was pretty cool. Elon Musk's rocket. It was, it was pretty dramatic. And we watched it. And it was, okay, that was cool. But this is, how, many, how much more is this cool where you're looking at the sky? And an angel appears to them and says, why are you looking at the clouds? Go do what he told you to do. And, and so they go to Jerusalem and Pentecost happens. Um, any questions? Max, I'm sorry. Any question where I actually use the last words? Does he bless them? Um, the Great Commission happens a couple times in the days of Jesus' resurrection. It's recorded in a different physical location in the Gospel of Mark and in Matthew. And so, um, and let's, let's go there. Let's, let's, we got the time. What's up? Oh, afterwards, afterwards. After we do this. Um, Mark 14, Mark 16, 14, a lot of controversy whether or not this is in the Gospel of Mark, don't listen to them. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at table. He rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of their heart because they did not believe those who had seen him right after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes in the and say, He who does not believe will be condemned. And so he gives the great commission there in Matthew, um, right as he appears to them. They haven't seen him yet. That's the first words he gives them. Um, In Matthew, the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which they had. Jesus said, appointed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, and some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority of heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father. Observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And 
so here is the same location as Luke, although Luke doesn't exactly record it from the same verbiage. So I, I guess that Luke had the Great Commission, and then Jesus gave another more explicit commission. Yeah, well, Luke's words are the Great Commission, but it's not the identical words. The pull is the same episode, same I think so. And so we, we understand that Matthew is recording it exactly as it happened. And Luke is translating it into Greek. To a Greek audience that doesn't have a foundation for Hebrew. And so some of what Luke says of Jesus is a paraphrase of what he said. But in, in, in Luke it says, and then after he said these things, they just had part of the words and then he left. In Matthew and Mark it said, Right after he said these things. So there was other remarks, maybe goodbye, yeah. see you in seventy years. But on the back of the John, you know. <coughs> Matthew seems to say that. that That's it. There's no other words. Yeah. And so the most important thing was reported. After he had said this, he departed. Is that true? It is. Yeah. After he said this, he said some parting words and departed. Is that same thing true? And they're not mutually exclusive. not that reported in Matthew. It just wasn't reported. Does it have to be reported to be verbatim? This is all he said. It doesn't have, in Matthew, it doesn't even have the oh, ascension. I meant Mark. Because it says so in Matthew, what it's looking for that he was receiving from the other times. I guess that's not mutually exclusive. It's not mutually exclusive. Usually exclusive means that two things can't be true simultaneously. I can't be simultaneously dead and alive. Like you hear that I wrecked my car and my car's not wrecked. It's not true. One of these things can't be true. Sir, what about the other box? And there's only I can only see the sun. I've just got two penguins. Gospel of Luke. God bless you. Have a good day.